I want an opportunity to become my own person. No stereotypes, not a single assumption about me, no tags, and certainly no labels. Unfortunately, these only exist as illogical dreams in my head. My reality as black and Nigerian is that my dreams might just end up as dreams forever because society has decided to place her false expectations about me right above my head. This is how it has been for so long. The unwritten rule, the stigma against every single Nigerian that they are uneducated, illiterate, four stars, and poor. A wise man once said, stereotypes are a bit like air, invisible, but always present. There just is no escape route to any of the horrendous stereotypes Nigerians encounter on a daily basis. Imagine if this was how your life was. Even the tiniest detail about you already assumed. So if someone thought you looked like a thief, that would be their only expectation of you. Whenever you walked by, they would treat you like a thief, which you aren't. They would continue repeating the same thing over and over and over, enough to make one actually see themselves as that untrue stereotype. That is plain mean, annoying in fact, because every single day you are judged, but in this case, you're judged not for what you can do, but by what society thinks you should be able to do. Society has snatched from so many Nigerians the opportunity to prove themselves, to earn an income, or to even achieve anything, something at all. The numerous opportunities society has deprived herself of, simply because she created a fantasy, a preconceived notion about Nigerians, and chose to run with it. There are always those awful experiences you hear about others when they encounter these horrific stereotypes. My first experience with being stereotyped happened when I was nine. I was on a family vacation. My siblings, along with my mom and I, decided to explore the places nearby a hotel. So as my mom and I waited at the front of a hotel, awaiting my siblings, we noticed a taxi right in front of us that had a pop tire. So we signaled to the driver, trying to attract his attention towards his pop tire. We were left dumbfounded as he threw at us a tattered $5 bill, and he yelled at our very faces to leave. It felt like I had a knife ripped out of my body. The only thought rushing through my nine-year-old mind was, what just happened? Did he assume we didn't have any money because we were black? My mind drifted back to the painful experience at the airport, and at that moment, I realized that I had once again been stereotyped. I walked up to the taxi driver and I told him I was only trying to inform him about his pop tire. And I made sure to tell him that I definitely did not need his tattered $5 bill. The guilt on his face was discernible. He knew what he had done, created a preconceived notion about me, and he chose to run with it. Frankly, I think my encounter at the airport 15 hours prior to mixing the taxi driver inspired my courageous attitude. My family and I had just landed in Los Angeles and we had picked up our bags and every other thing we needed. All we had left to do was go past immigration and would finally be able to get our hotel. So we stepped up to the counter and proceeded to hand in our green passports. Instantly, the officer's face turned sour. I was confused. A train of questions followed us. He kept asking us why we came to Los Angeles, if we had enough money to cover our trip, or whether we had plans to run away from Nigeria. The series of questions all hinted to whether we had plans of running away from home. My nine-year-old me just thought they were doing their job. But only now do I realize that they were not doing their job. Other people of other nationalities were there, but they only chose to set our bags. They only chose to ask us thousands of questions. He pulled us aside and instructed us to wait for him to get back to us. We became the center of attention. Everyone was looking at us and pointing. What had we done to deserve this? As the officer returned to his table, it dawned on me that the password the person showed was a red one. I expected him to start interrogating the man, and I had subconsciously created a spot for me for the young man to stand since I already assumed he would be asked to stay by our side. I didn't expect that to happen. The man was not asked a single question. 
The officer had plastered onto his face the brightest smile and he told him, welcome to Los Angeles. Confused definitely could describe what was happening. I began to tug at my dad's shirt. And when he looked at me, I asked, why did they let him go and not us? He only pat my head in response to my dismay. I now realized that a part of him had expected that to happen. Five seconds later, the same officer walked back to us and he began to search all of our bags. He scattered all of our neatly packed items. My three-year-old brother was in tears as our bags were torn open and scattered. We were being assessed. And I remember thinking we had been arrested. My parents were downcast. My older sister was down and I regretful. They had searched our bags, questioned us, gotten our hotel reservation information. They kept us for a whole three hours. There were other people from different countries, but they only gifted us with their special attention. We were the only ones from our plane that were yet to leave the airport. I kept seeing people handing their passports and they were gifted with a generic greeting. Welcome to Los Angeles. Have a fun time. To my utmost disgust, the passenger I had recognized that was let to go without being questioned was given express clearance on the perception that everything was fine and that nothing was wrong. And there we were, pulled aside. Three hours after we were done, we met the same guy stranded at the parking lot, waiting for someone to give him a helping hand. The man from Central Europe that the officer thought was okay ended up having a struggle. It was my family that had to give the guy from Central Europe a lift. He had no money, and we ended up having to give him a $100 bill so he could feed himself. The person that was supposed to give the young man a ride ended up bailing on him. And the poor man didn't even have enough money to afford public transportation. But there we were, able to reserve a car to come pick us up. That's the ill of stereotyping. Once you present to them the Nigerian passport, it's assumed that you are hassling to migrate illegally. They assume you are low on funds. This is my reality. This is also the reality of practically every single Nigerian. A world whereby I am assumed to be unable to afford a family vacation or that I am in dire need of a tattered $5 bill. I'm tagged as the inferior one, the incapable one. My dream is non-existent. Queen Rainier of Jordan once said, we shouldn't judge people through the prism of our own stereotypes. Don't make an assumption about me because of what you think Nigerians are supposed to be able to afford or how you think Nigerians are supposed to be able to act. At the end of the day, home is home. And it's not everyone that's interested in overstaying their visa or every Nigerian that is poor or dubious. And as much as there are issues about Nigeria, there are many Nigerians that live decently and are quite comfortable. So, do not judge me based off of your own stereotype. I am not your stereotype. I am Olubero Oluwatin Dominion.